For this uh, second uh, lunch talk, we also continuing with the theme of resiliency, but we switching to resiliency of infrastructure, and we having a talk with the title "Change Agents for Resilient Infrastructure," which I can assure you it will be a, a very interesting talk by a very well-known speaker, Professor Thomas O'Rourke, uh, who is the Professor O'Rourke is the Thomas Briggs Professor of Engineering uh, in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University, my alma mater, so I'm very proud of that. Uh, he holds his PhD and master degree from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and his undergraduate degree from the school where he works in, also Cornell. And he is a, a very well-known authority in so many areas, uh, geotechnical systems, uh, distributed system for water, electricity. Uh, and I'm not going to take uh, a lot of time introducing him. You can read his bio, the short bio in the peer website. And if you click on his name, you get his long bio. If you click one more time, you get his Cornell website and you can learn about uh, the many projects he was involved in, the hundreds of presentations he gave, uh, the very long list of awards that I'm not going to list here, uh, but I can assure you it will be uh, a very interesting and informative uh, talk. Professor O'Rourke. Thank you, Halid, for the very nice introduction. Also, thank you and Pierre uh, very much for putting together a wonderful annual meeting. Uh, probably the theme of this annual meeting, among others, is there's so many nice people here. Uh, on my way to this annual meeting, I took a cab, and the cab driver's name was Clarence. Now, those who've seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life realize that every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Uh, uh, the person who set up the, uh, the presentation, his name is Gabriel. So I have to say that, that coming to this uh, particular meeting, I'm in the presence of angels. <laughs> also, I'd like to say that, uh, that uh, boy, what uh, a, a difference one day in weather makes, right? So, so we've also had a meteorological lesson. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, change agents uh, for resilient infrastructure. And, and the basic theme of this is, is really hurricanes. It's about floods, it's about hurricanes, and it's not so much about earthquakes, but it's about the kinds of things that happen after earthquakes and happen before earthquakes. And it also deals with a lot of natural disasters, which I understand that Pierre is trying to develop and to move into. And I think that's a great idea because it's wonderful not just to focus on earthquakes, but it's terrific to focus on floods and to focus on all sorts of natural hazards, which really do deserve the expertise of the people in this room. So I'm going to also give the, the, the punchline. The talk is Change Agents for Resilient Infrastructure, but there is an organization wherever we go that is between the community and the researchers, and that is the agencies. The agencies that control the water supplies, the agencies that control the electricity, the agencies that control the gas. And if we don't change the agencies, then we're not doing the job we need to. We can change communities, but primarily we need to change the people that intervene between us and those communities, as well as the communities. So if you're going to be a change agent for infrastructure, if you're going to be a change agent, you need to change agencies. I'm going to refer to this, and John Bray is well familiar with this image. This is an image of the intersection of Wall Street and William Street in about 1920-21. You can tell by the boater hats. And this is what's happening beneath the ground in our major cities. There is a plethora, a literal plethora, of, of lifelines, of, of, of critical services, of critical uh, features uh, that, that conform and work together. We don't even know where they're co-located many times. And uh, those people who saw the movie with Nicolas Cage, uh, the uh, American treasure, the national treasure, 
this is the national treasure. This is the national treasure that we take and we bury underneath the ground and we don't even know where it exists. And there has been movement uh, lately in research that says that a lot of the things that are happening are done by elitists. Uh, that may or may not be true, but I will say one thing for sure. When you look at this picture and you see the incredible underground space and you get this idea for the incredible interdependencies of the infrastructure that exists in our major cities and you take a look at our natural treasure, which we bury like every good treasure and then forget about it, you recognize that probably more will be learned to help people by looking and studying this inner space than the work in outer space. I'm going to fade this particular uh, image and I'm going to then take a look at the topics that I'll address today. They are global hazards, the World Trade Center disaster and Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and then the L-Line Tunnel. This is an opportunity that I had with the Dean at Cornell to work with the Governor of New York State uh, and be uh, able to engage in some of the reconstruction that is occurring in New York as a consequence of Hurricane Sandy. So let's start with global hazards. If we take a look at the globe, in 2050 there's going to be about nine and a half billion people here. Uh, earthquake seismicity isn't necessarily increasing. The Earth is a pretty dynamic body and it has the same dynamism year to year that it has had since we've been recording earthquakes. The thing that's different is that people are moving into locations where earthquakes have a very significant impact on things. A great example of this is the Sea of Amara where from about 1970 to about 2020 the population has increased threefold. That's three times the amount of people that are subject to seismicity associated with the Anatolian Fault. So there are some important global trends with respect to increased numbers of people exposing themselves to earthquake situations. We also know that we live in a world of global warming and you can take whatever prediction you want. I've got them virtually all up here uh, on the left hand side of the screen. And they tell us that by 2100, um, there's going to be between a two and a five degree increase in temperature if we continue uh, with the models that we have and also not complying with some of the restrictions that are important. This means that the waters are going to heat up greater. There's going to be more storms, but most importantly, there's going to be bad storms, storms that are very significant that get to be hurricane uh, category fives. And the most important thing with respect to the hurricanes and the categorization of hurricanes is not so much the wind. Of course, that's important for places that get electricity and so forth. But it's especially important for the storm surge because it's the underwater aspects of the hurricanes that create the flooding and have a dramatic impact on the infrastructure. We can also look at disasters as disaster du jour. If we just take arbitrarily a 10 year period of time from about 2004 to about 2014, we have a number of significant events which are shown up on this slide and we can begin to itemize certain aspects about these events. For example, the Sumatra Andaman earthquake and tsunami is the third largest earthquake ever recorded. It's about a 9.1 moment magnitude. Um, we have the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. Again, that's the fourth largest earthquake that's ever been recorded. Uh, and that's about a 9 to a 9.1 moment magnitude. And then we have the 2010 Maui earthquake, which is the sixth largest ever recorded. It's a moment magnitude of about 8.8. .8. So within a 10 year period of time, we got three of the top six, and moreover, we can actually look at hurricanes and tsunami in terms of their impact on the local societies. For example, the Sumatra Andaman earthquake and tsunami left about 230,000 people dead. It's incredible. Um, there's about 16,000 dead after the Hoku earthquake and tsunami, and that doesn't account for those who are missing. And of course, there's the Haiti earthquake, uh, again, about a seven point magnitude in Haiti with a forward directivity toward Port-au-Prince. Um, 
they have reported about 240,000 dead. Uh, there's been a, a valuation of that, and the number is closer to about 120,000, but, but very significant in terms of loss of life. We can look at disaster du jour by just picking out particular years. So for example, we can take 2017, and some of the major disasters are shown on this particular slide. If we isolate some of the major hurricanes, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, we can then take a look at their impact in terms of dollars. Hurricane Harvey almost gets to Hurricane Katrina. It's about $125 billion of direct losses, quite significant, and an enormous amount learned about living in floodplains. Hurricane Irma, about $50 billion, terrible influence on Florida, and then Hurricane Maria, about 90 billion, one of the biggest uh, historically in terms of, of cost, of course having a dramatic impact on Puerto Rico. In fact, Hurricane Maria changed the lighting in Puerto Rico, and this is a satellite image of before and after. Obviously, there are some local distribution networks that are left in place, but the major electricity for the, 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 the country was lost. It's just been subjected to some severe earthquakes uh, just in the southern part. Uh, I guess the largest magnitude is about 6.4. So they have really taken us to a level where it's been about a year to get the electricity back. And then there's an earthquake which takes out a significant part of that electricity. So that's quite significant. And of course, with Hurricane Harvey, as with Hurricane Katrina, as with Hurricane Sandy, we have the enormous surging and the flooding Hurricane Harvey, it wasn't so much the surge, but it was the incredible rainfall up to 50 inches per hour, or 50 inches total, and uh, an enormous amount of flooding and uh, a need to change our national uh, uh, insurance policies with respect to flooding. And a lot of people have been working on that. I'd like to comment a little about, about the World Trade Center disaster uh, and Hurricane uh, Katrina. Uh, the World Trade Center disaster occurred in September uh, 2011, uh, 2001, and uh, the 11th of September. Uh, and it really had a dramatic impact on the way we handle hazards in, in the United States. In fact, you could define the world as before the World Trade Center and after the World Trade Center. As a consequence of the World Trade Center, uh, we created the, home, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. They actually defined critical infrastructure into about 16 different categories. But what's really important is they developed a policy which existed for at least five years and probably longer than that, which was the protection of critical infrastructure, a very, very noble goal. Uh, the problem with the protection of critical infrastructure is you have to pick the infrastructure, and there's really no good protocol for doing that in the United States. There is a different protocol, I assure you, in New York City at, that exists on the West Coast, at least insofar as water supplies are concerned. New York City is far more conservative about the, the amount of information that it produces uh, and allows to be uh, published. And uh, there is much more openness in terms of the West Coast approach to this particular matter. So we had this protection of critical infrastructure that went on for a number of years until, and we can show the vector, there was Hurricane Katrina, in which case the mantra became resilient communities. They became resilient communities even before we were able to find resilience. And of course, there's a lot of literature out there in terms of defining resilience. Uh, basically, it's the ability of a community to bounce back and to adapt to changes that occur with respect to uh, major hazards. Uh, it's a very supple definition. There's a lot of more detail associated with it. But we, as a nation and as a world, tend to work within the tensions that have been created by the World Trade Center disaster and Hurricane Katrina. We tend to work within the confines of protecting critical infrastructure at the same time as creating resilient communities. And as I mentioned, there is a need to bring together a protocol that would be a little more consistent and allow us uh, to do this with a little more uh, forcefulness. It's really important not to disclose certain information about certain infrastructure, but it's really important to share information about certain infrastructure with communities like this because there are many, many, many more people who want to improve that infrastructure than want to destroy it or harm it. In 2005, if we can just remember this particular year for an instance, there were uh, many, many hurricanes. 
there was Hurricane Emily. Now, we were going on vacation. This is an honest goodness true story. My wife and I were going on vacation to a place called Eshbuja in Mexico. And Hurricane Emily was one of the first named hurricanes of the season, and it completely wiped out Eshbuja. Um, we then booked on Cozumel. And uh, Wilma, we're going to see, was the last big earthquake, or at least in the uh, uh, English alphabet. And that was completely destroyed because the hurricane set on Cozumel for, at a Category 4 for about three days. And we very little hear about the Mexicans responding to the hurricane disasters, which they did quite well. At the same time with Hurricane Wilma, uh, improving the performance of, of the Yucatan uh, resorts, uh, we actually had Hurricane Katrina, which was, was a difficult time trying to recover from. I happened to be on the National Academy's committee for Hurricane Katrina and spent every three months about three days for about four years in New Orleans. So learned quite a bit about the recovery from hurricanes processes. We had Katrina, we had Rita, which, which literally occurred within about 24 days uh, on top of Katrina and came very, very close to Katrina. And then we had Wilma, which uh, just mentioned had dramatic impacts. In fact, uh, we had about 28 named storms, about 15 named hurricanes. People have put together statistics in aggregate of about $180 billion for all these in terms of direct losses. We had so many named hurricanes that we ran out of the English alphabet. And we had to go to the Greek alphabet to be able to name the last couple of hurricanes. And I call that the Greek bailout of the American <laughs> Meteorological Society. One of the major hurricanes to affect policy tremendously in the United States was Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy killed about 160 people. It resulted in about $68 billion of property and business losses, which were supplied by Congress in attempts to make things equal. Um, it was preceded by Hurricane Irene. A lot of people forget about Hurricane Irene. It was a tremendous flooding event in Vermont in New Hampshire, but it was really severe in New York City. It flooded a lot of the hospitals. And of course, the hospitals is where the uh, generators are, and the generators uh, lost their power, and therefore very uh, important equipment in the hospitals couldn't function along the East River, and they had to remove the patients in order, and, and in very difficult circumstances, they needed to be able to uh, adjust to this. Uh, the same problems occurred during Hurricane Sandy. In fact, Hurricane Irene was just overtopping uh, the the Battery, which is at the southern end of Manhattan, and. In Hurricane Irene, we had a near miss, but in Hurricane Sandy, we had a direct hit. Now, if we look at the east coast of the United States, what generally happens, hurricanes in the northern hemisphere spin in a counterclockwise direction. And the fetch is given by these tangential winds. And the tangential winds whip up, and they whip up the surf, and pretty soon there's a real surge that's going on. Um, so basically, these hurricanes tend to parallel the coast, and so there is very often a tangential wind which creates the surge, which creates the big, uh, major problems associated with the hurricane. What happened in, in Hurricane Sandy was it was Superstorm Sandy. There was another storm that was coming off the, from the east. It dragged Sandy in just about northern New Jersey, just about the harbor of New York City. And not only did you get the velocity associated with the tangential winds, but you got the velocity associated with the center of rotation, which together added to the winds, which added to the surge, which created many of the major problems associated with the earthquake. And that surge went directly up, as this arrow indicates, the uh, Hudson River in the New York City Harbor, and it had a dramatic effect upon the battery. We're going to keep showing the battery, the dramatic effect on New York City. Now, this happens to be the hydrograph that's at the battery. It's the southern part of Manhattan. And what you see from this surge is we got about 13.9 feet. We're going to call that 14 feet of surge associated with the rise in the sea level around New York City. Two feet of this was the tidal variation. We had about a four-foot tidal variation. And as this surge came on shore at at 12 feet, there was actually an additional two feet that were measured associated with the tidal variations, which you can see very clearly on this particular slide. This plays an important role. I'm going to mention that in just a minute. So this is the water. What we can do is what FEMA did. FEMA actually took GISs of the New York City area, 
they took this increase uh, associated with the hydrograph at the battery and increased the mean sea level by 14 feet associated with the surge and then inundated, uh, showed the inundation associated with the elevations that are built into these satellite images. So this is the New York City area. What we are going to do is convert that into portions of this area that were underwater and there was a tremendous amount of flooding that occurred and dramatic impacts associated with the hurricane. This is just to give you some perspective. There's LaGuardia Airport that was totally underwater. I took a special concern about that because I used to fly from Cornell to LaGuardia. I couldn't particularly do it after this hurricane because of the major problems. In fact, Hurricane Sandy, I was in town. Uh, I was actually talking to the vice president of, of Con Edison and was talking to the deputy mayor on the Friday before this earthquake. And they had to leave. They were actually called by Michael Bloomberg into special session because it was pretty clear that the hurricane was going to come towards New York City at that time. It, it actually made landfall and, on the Monday night, and that's when I got the hydrograph from that particular hydrograph uh, USGS station in the battery. Uh, and um, uh, one does not want to be in a major area of natural disasters uh, when there's a major effect uh, uh, taking uh, technical data. They want to let the emergency responders do what they're supposed to do. There's also the battery that's shown on here. And I'm now going to increase the size of the, uh, the map of the southern Manhattan at where the battery is. And I'm going to show you what was underwater at the time. And then I'm going to illustrate a little bit of, of what happened. The World Trade Center, you'll notice, was underwater. It was underwater a second time, so to speak. And the 2001 9-11 uh, disaster, the all the cables came out of the World Trade Center for the Verizon uh, building, this 140 West Street, on the same side. Uh, and as a consequence, there was a lot of firefighting that went on. There was a flooding of the cable box. It was also uh, destroyed in part by the collapse of one of the towers. Uh, and as a consequence, there was a loss in the telecommunications, which required a reinstatement along with the electric power before the could actually open up Wall Street, which was five days after uh, the major effect of the World Trade Center disaster. So we had real problems associated with the telecommunication system. There are five stories to West 140 West Street is where the Verizon building is. And the generators, because of fire restrictions, were placed in the very bottom. Now a generator, when it's full of fuel, is going to be lighter than water. It's going to want to float, and they're very rarely full. So unless they're tethered, they float around. And even if they're tethered, they're going to have a fuel line that runs along the interior surface of the buildings, and that fuel line has to be attached to the walls, because as the water starts to come up in the basements, there is also going to be floatsum as part of this water and the flotsam I saw many locations where they just battered some of the fuel lines and they battered some of the uh, gas lines and so on and so forth associated with the rising waters. So we have real problems associated with the World Trade Center disaster, uh, the World Trade Center, and what actually happened was that they had the generators, um, uh, the fuel was actually in the fifth basement floor. The, the actual generator was on the seventh floor. They brought the generator to the surface and they had a truck, a special truck that actually had fuel in it. They put the fuel together with the generator that was on the street surface. It was guarded by armed guards and they began to generate electricity, which was the electricity that powered uh, Wall Street and allowed it to open two days after the event. Now, you'll notice on this slide there's the L-Line tunnel. I'm going to actually give a case history of the L-Line. But you can see that that was also flooded, along with many other tunnels in New York. And in 2019, 2020, we're reconstructing the L-Line. This is seven to eight years after 2012, when the hurricane occurred. There's a long tail, just like with earthquakes, to the recovery curves. And recovering these tunnels reminded me a lot of trying to recover the bridges associated with the major earthquakes in California. Um, there was a Broad Street station. So Verizon worked off the principle of double jeopardy. All right, You'd have to take out at least two stations. Many of the tunnels were the same way. They had electricity supplied by New Jersey, uh, and they had electricity supplied by Con Edison in New York. 
The problem is that both electricities went out. So you didn't have the electricity when the tunnels got flooded. And as a consequence, you had to get special pumps from the fire department and actually pump them out and begin to get them to be operable again. The Broad Street was also flooded. That actually had more copper cables. Copper drinks in the water. And of course, it's corrosive. And it corrodes enormously when it's associated with the copper cables. And as a consequence, that entire Battery Street or Broad Street Station went down. And, and Verizon invested over a billion dollars in bringing it back into service many months after this, this event. It was the World Trade Center um, uh, central office that actually got Wall Street powered. Now we have this tremendous inundation, and you can see the New York City subway system immediately adjacent to inundated portions. And we're going to move the two of them together, and we're then going to make this opaque. And what you can see on this opaque location, and if you have, uh, if you can see this red line, uh, we have the uh, Ferry Street Station, uh, and that uh, had a lot of water that, that, that flowed into it. Okay, for some reason this has gone... Okay, over. And if you take a look at the Ferry Street Station, you can see that it had it, it, it's it's elevated at the street surface, and the tunnels go on for many miles before they get to an elevation which is the same as the Ferry Street Station, which is connected with all these tunnels. And until the water actually reached an elevation that balanced the Ferry Street Station, they got flooded. So a significant amount of the tunneling for the New York City Transit Authority actually got flooded in this event. Um, this is some of the flooded tunnels. Uh, there are 20, there, there are 13 tunnels that are associated with this. Three of these tunnels happen to be vehicular tunnels. They're car tunnels. They're tunnels uh, such as the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and the Midtown Tunnel. They are single tunnels. But every other tunnel, the other 10, are associated with transit or, or um, uh, Amtrak lines and these had an inbound and an outbound tunnel. So there's actually 10 more tunnels associated with each of the train traffic tunnels that contributed to the damage associated with Hurricane Sandy. There were 23 in total that were damaged. So there is a long part of the restoration curve getting into these tunnels because once they've been undated, you cannot get the salt water completely out of them. You have to go in there and completely reconstruct in order to do that. And so there's continuing deter deterioration. There's continuing problems with respect to the, tr uh, the track and the signaling and so forth. And of course, once you take out a large portion of any network, like you see has been eliminated on the left-hand side of this, and we can actually illustrate this with a circle, you've really taken out the transportation network. It took about a week uh, to restore reasonable service in New York with respect to the subway system. In fact, there were many stories of people that tried to get to um, gas stations and they tried to use their cards, but the electricity was out and so you couldn't use your electronic money in order to get these particular uh, uh, tanks filled. And even when you could, there was no gas at the gas stations because it had a tremendous effect on the oil and the gas that came into the various ports as well as the gas stations associated with it. Now. There was a 138 kV station uh, at about 12th Street by Con Edison. Now, we're going to go back to the surge. The surge was 14 feet, but that's because two feet of tidal uh, effect. There was a wall associated with this substation that was 12 feet high. Fortunately, it was two feet below the tidal surge. It flooded. You can actually see the generator explode. You can still go to YouTube and see this particular movie. And when that generator exploded, what Con Edison did was they turned off the lights. They took the electricity, turned it off from about 38th Street southward. So the entire southern part of Manhattan was without electricity. In addition, Con Edison operates a steam system. The steam starts with very good principles. Number one, you, you want to use the fossil fuel plants effectively. So by cogeneration, you pick up the heat from the fossil fuel plants, and with 105 miles of tunnel, of, of, excuse me, a pipeline, you distribute that energy, that heat, in terms of steam lines. And so you have the steam distribution, and that was turned off because the steam actually becomes a bomb 
in the process of being inundated. Uh, the New York steam system, 105 miles, and if we just were to look at the distribution, which is the major part of it, um, we have pressures between 100 and 180 PSI, and we have temperatures that are between 415, um, uh, excuse me, 230 degrees centigrade. It's actually higher than the boiling of water because of the higher pressures that exist as a consequence of the steam system. Uh, what happens when these get cooled by inundation is they develop bubbles and the bubbles actually coalesce and they become confinement and eventually the lines blow. It's not uncommon to have steam lines blow in New York City. One happened in 2007 on 42nd Street, killed a person. It had dramatic impacts on the infrastructure. It's a famous quote from Mayor Bloomberg associated with that event. Um, but many times what happens are the steam lines will go down in New York City and they are encrusted, they are encapsulated um, with asbestos and that asbestos gets washed to the nearest gradient, the nearest uh, gravity sink which is typically the gradient associated with the air filters and systems for the subways and they get washed into the subways or they get spewed across facades and the next thing you know that they are closing buildings and they're closing subway stations because people with moon suits have to go in and clean up the asbestos which is then uh, with the inundation completely affecting the stations. So lessons from Hurricane Sandy are there's a long tail recovery. Uh, we have to protect against these tunnels flooding. None of these tunnels were protected. Now if you drive through the Midtown Tunnel, you'll see the protective doors. They are there to be closed to keep the water out in the event there is a major hurricane. And furthermore, there's over a, a thousand different stops associated with tightening up and keeping water away from problems where water can get into. There's a lot of doors, dikes, and diversions that have been created. One of these is shown as this inflatable tube that's uh, been utilized to be able to close some of the tunnels. Um, we need backup power for water supply on buildings. The water supply in New York City comes from the Hillview Reservoir. That's the balancing reservoir for New York City. The elevation of Hillview will get water up to the 20th story, just because of the elevation difference, up to the 20th story in the major high rises. Higher than that, there's no water. They, they have to depend on whatever the water is in the tank at the time. And the water gets up to the tank because there is a generator system that, that powers the water that they actually keeps it up to the tank. So you happen to have during Hurricane Sandy is people stranded in the top floors of buildings because all electric power became distributed, right? Con Edison took away that electric power. The buildings depended upon this this, this uh, the ability to pump the water up and they didn't have the capabilities in many cases to do that. In some cases they were tremendously successful like NYU had its own distribution station and was able to generate lots of electricity for NYU students um, without having to rely on the Con Edison or on this problem with respect to the generators. And if we have backup power for buildings we always have wind during buildings. It's very possible to have a wind generator to continue to supply power and electricity, whereas clearly solar panels wouldn't work during a hurricane. And then we need to remove the diesel generators from the basements. We're still probably going to have the fuel tanks in the, in the basements, and so we have to worry about and tether and, and, and armor some of the um, lines that come up and protect them so that they're able to supply a power for the individual buildings. Okay, technology from Hurricane Sandy. There's unmanned autonomous vehicles. Uh, Demetrius Ekos does a lot of work in this and what I've learned about this comes in large measure through him. I have to say that, uh, that there's a tremendous use of unmanned autonomous vehicles in the next big hurricane uh, because they are able to take information from cameras and be able to, to plot uh, three-dimensional views of what's going on with greater, greater accuracy than LIDAR. So they're really, uh, through the structure and motion, really offer a tremendous opportunity to acquire sorely needed information. Um, we're going to see the building information models not just develop for buildings. Um, about 10 years ago I was lucky enough to be in London and they had a building information model for um, one of the major uh, 
subway stations. And, and there, it was where the tunnels and the uh, utilities connected. And it was really that information that allowed the printout three-dimensionally of what was going on underground at Victoria Station. Um, we we're actually going to see these flood zones and the bathymetry and the so forth with various communities contributing to the increase in the building information models associated with these flood zones. And then we have these deployable flood protections. There's the HESCO bastions. These are collapsible fabrics. They're, they're wire. Uh, they're large. They're three feet by four feet by about 32 feet. They're filled up uh, by virtue of, of, of small um, bulldozers. Um, they're named after the company, the British company that first uh, uh, put them into place, and they were used during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, there's tiger dams. There's these inflatable sausages that, that create barriers, and they can be built up one with respect to the other. They're inflated with water, and they're used to keep water out. So there's a lot of different uh, of technologies that can help us with the hurricanes. There's a great, great report called the New York City Resilience Plan. It was authorized by Michael Bloomberg. And I highly recommend it as reading, as, as absolutely required reading, for the effects of hurricanes and also the effect of, of climate control. New York City had a commission for climate control that was instated by Michael Bloomberg in 2008. Um, and it, it's doing reports since 2010. And now, in the last couple of years, it's part of the actual commissioning of building space in New York City. You have to be able to show how your new construction uh, enters into the building space. There is a study that was completed in March of 2019, which is called the Lower Manhattan Climate Resilience. It's, it's from Mayor de Blasio. And there's about three and a third miles in southern Manhattan. You can see some of the locations here. Uh, you have the battery. You're really good if you can see this red dot. Uh, the Battery Park City. Uh, you have the Twin uh, Bridges. These areas are getting about $500 million, and some of the technologies that we just talked about are going to be instated. One of the best ways of keeping flood waters out of a city is actually to build up the levels. And so basically there's going to be esplanades, uh, locations where people walk. They're about 20 feet higher than where they are right now, and that 20 feet is going to provide the barrier against the surge related to the hurricanes, as well as some of those temporary deployment measures. Where there's real problems is associated with the financial district in New York City. They're so crowded in there that they can't solve the problem with elevation changes. And in that particular area, the recommendation from this report is to extend from the seawall outward a block, at least a block, with fill. And the solution for that is going to cost closer to $10 billion. That money has not been identified or shown where it's going to come from as of yet. But that's the best of the technology to date. The last topic I'm going to deal with deals with this long part of the distribution curve, the restoration of the tunnels. And it deals with the L-Line tunnel. Um, the L-Line is a train uh, associated with the rapid transit system of New York. And uh, it's about uh, one and a half miles long, about 2.4 kilometers long. Uh, and uh, it was built uh, almost 100 years ago. If we take a look at the L-Line with this inset map, it starts at 8th Avenue, goes across Manhattan, uh, and then it goes across the East River and enters into Brooklyn and gets all the way to Canarsie. Now, I don't know how many people are familiar with Canarsie. There's at least one person here, Charlie Scawthorn. But Canarsie, I've been told, and I've been, been benefited by it, as, as having the best bagels in the world. So if you close the L-Line, not only do you have a major transportation problem, there's, a, there's about uh, 250,000 passengers per day, but you have a major culinary disaster because there's no bagels to be had. So it was really essential to bring this thing back. The, the solution that the traditional civil engineers had come up with is to shut it down for anywhere from a year and three months to a year and a half and rebuild it and then restart it again and have the passengers take it again. They had all sorts of bus services and so forth. There was a huge losses in, in uh, real estate. People were having to move because they were no longer close to a, a railroad station for a year and a half. It was a major problem. In 2012, this L-Line was flooded by Hurricane Sandy. And uh, basically, it was flooded from the shafts. So we have the fan plants. Plant plant shafts, those are great locations for water to come in. You can see that the center 350 
3,500 feet was flooded, uh, including the pump rooms. And then they actually had to do repairs that went from one station, that's the Bedford Avenue station, to the First Avenue station to, to try to bring this thing back uh, nearly about uh, uh, one and, and a half miles or so, or, or about one and a half miles of, of, of total length. Um, this tunnel was constructed with the best technology of its time. It was cast iron plates. And the cast iron tunnel was driven under compressed air. And these plates were put into place as the primary lining and the secondary lining, which is a structural lining that goes in and allows the trains to operate, uh, was, was about 10 inches of reinforced concrete, about a foot of reinforced concrete. Uh, the, the diameter of the tunnel varies between 15 and 15 and a half feet, so it's actually a pretty small tunnel. If we look at this tunnel, uh, what you can see in this picture is the uh, bench walls, and that has all the cabling, including the power that generates and makes this train go. And it has the dynamic envelope, so the train is not a static thing, right? When this train actually moves, it moves back and forth at any particular location along the tunnel. And so you have to design, if you're going to take anything out of these bench walls, you have to design it so that it fits in this very narrow space here or it just doesn't plain work. So the bench walls became important uh, in terms of a solution to this problem. Um, the bench wall looks like this. It's a walkway. It's a concrete wall. It's a cables and so forth. Um, and uh, there was an additional problem associated with the, the yellow line tunnel that the bench walls uh, actually, in part, were subject to alkali silica reaction. So basically, in the aggregate, they had amorphous silica, uh, at quartz, and they had a very high pH associated with the powder, associated with the cement. And the combination of those with inundated waters, right, created a new material, a new chemical that expanded in volume. And as it's expanding in volume, it's causing the other concrete to crack and peel away. And so central to improving and getting this construction going with passengers was to reinforce and to reduce as much as possible this bench wall construction. So to do this, the governor of New York, um, Governor Cuomo, uh, got an expert review panel organized from Cornell and Columbia universities. The members of this review panel were Mary Boyce, who's the Dean of Engineering at Columbia. Lance Collins, who I became very good friends with, have great admiration for him, have admiration for everybody on the team, who is the Dean of Engineering at Cornell. There was George Diodatus from Columbia. Uh, there was Peter Kingett, who's electrical engineer. Uh, there was uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew Smith, and there was myself. We came up with this recommendation. That's part of the record. I'm not going to go into that. That's an eye test. But what I am going to go into are some of the recommendations in a way that you can see what they are. The first thing we said is you need to decouple the power cables housing from the bench walls. Take them out of the bench walls. We were always told as a matter of truth that the electric cabling had to be in the bench walls, otherwise it was unprotected. But that's not true because that was true when the tunnels were built in the 20s, but now if we go to the last particular bullet item, we have jacket cables with zero halogen fireproof material. And they're successful in the airline and aerospace industry. And they also satisfy the National Fire Protection Agency 130 fire code. So we took them out, we hung them on special composite hangers. The biggest problem was making sure we had the space with the dynamic envelope. And I worked with the engineers, the WSPU did a great job. The engineers of the Port Authority, the, excuse me, the, 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 the the Metropolitan Transit Authority did a great job, and the engineers with Jacobs, who was doing the construction management, did a great job. Very often in these projects, and I've worked on the superconducting super collider, and I've worked on the Boston Artery, and believe me, there are plenty of politics associated with both of those projects. There wasn't politics here. It was just get the job done. Let's just get it fixed. They did a great job. I get that to, to, to really uh, give them a lot of, of, of satisfaction for that. The bench wall, we left it, we're structurally stable, and we fortified that bench wall structure with fiber reinforced polymers. It was a wrap, it was a strapping, it reduced the need for continuous fixes, and it removed unstable weight uh, uh, bench wall. This, this fiber reinforced polymer became so popular that they actually ended up reinforcing about 90% of the bench wall with this material and only had to remove 10%. That had an amazing impact with respect to the um, the timeline. 
We also installed smart fiber optic sensors. Kenichi Soga from, from Berkeley helped tremendously on this project. Um, and, and so we installed these fibers because there is an alkali silica reaction. They're going to expand. These fibers are going to get particular strains. They're very long fibers, a very long strain oriented, and they provide a supplement to it is already available on each of the trains, which is a high resolution LIDAR. They actually go through once a day with the high resolution LIDAR and take very, very dense point clouds of the elevations of the different facilities along the tunnel. That in combination with the fiber optics gave us our instrumentation session. So the fiber optics uh, has actually been proven. It's been proven by Kenichi with respect to the London Underground and a number of other undergrounds in the United States. Uh, we can actually use a, uh, a different types of method. We, we, can, uh, we can use a, a fiber optic which uses a pulse of, 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 of LiDAR beams uh, 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 that go through the cable. And we also can use it as a re reflectometry a system which the impurities actually, if one of the cables gets, one of them gets broken, can actually reflect and, and provide for strain associated uh, with the readouts. These were used uh, quite successfully uh, for LIDAR with respect to the London Bridge and with respect to the, um, uh, the fiber optic cables, and therefore it was a proven technology. There are many recommendations that came from us that, that enhanced or expanded on some of the recommendations that were being enacted. We gave them some additional ones with respect to the waterproofing and the waterproof doors. Uh, this is the L-line, and there are a number of improvements associated with mechanical closure devices, uh, maritime doors, waterproof hatches, uh, watertight manholes. Uh, in addition, there was the public safety issue. When, when you actually go in and you tear out a bench wall, you create silica dust. Silica dust is very dangerous for passengers. And so there had to be a monitoring process in place that would tell you that the silica dust wasn't going to be a problem. And so we actually recommended, and they enacted it, that there be a quality control, which was done by the contractor who actually took the measurements, and a quality assurance that was done by an additional contractor that worked directly and reported to the, to the Metropolitan Transit Authority uh, to be able to vouchsafe uh, these particular measurements. That means that there was no closure of service necessary and work could be completed with weekend and nighttime closures on a one tube at a time basis. This new system design approach can be potentially applied to other projects such as the Second Avenue subway phase two and the Amtrak tunnels. And what we have, excuse me, is the Hudson River tunnel project, which is actually underway. They're building a whole new tunnel for about $13 billion underneath the southern part of the Hudson River, right over here. And here's the old line, and actually some of this work can actually be used to restore the bench walls and get improved surface in the older lines. In fact, that study is going through this semester. There are going to be people from um, Columbia and Cornell working on the project. I'm going to go back to this, this, this symbol of, of the underground infrastructure. I'm going to end this talk with the last two slides. Um, in this slide, I'm going to give what are some of the major lessons that, that we learned and some of the major lessons which I think would resonate and have importance with the people at this particular meeting. So we have lessons uh, for resilient infrastructure. Number one is it takes a village to build infrastructure. Infrastructure isn't particularly there for the engineers and it's not there for the planners, right? It's, it's there for the people. And unless you consider the people as part of this whole process, you're really not closing the loop. And one of the major problems associated with the L-Line and, and where the governor got involved and became a major agent of change was that the governor entered into the agencies and said there must be other criteria that apply to this. We can't take 250,000 people out of commuter service per day. There has to be a better political solution. Uh, we were able to come up with a solution that stuck. In fact, they're actually going to open this and repair it three months early, we, we found out. So this has been a very successful project, but it's always been a project that's focused on the people. It's focused on the village aspects of infrastructure. First of all, and second of all, the, in order to be, in order to change agents uh, versus agencies that don't change, um, universities, like University of California at Berkeley, like Cornell University, have for years developed relationships 
with major agencies. We have changed the way they work business. Uh, the major agency that Cornell works with is the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And we've, we've completely modeled uh, all 10,000 kilometers of pipelines and, and different kinds of facilities and so forth. Charlie's worked a whole lot on the San Francisco water supply system. I've worked in part with him. Um, and we've changed the way agencies have looked at things, but they've changed the way that we look at agencies. So there's a double change that goes on here, which is extremely important because it, it actually focuses on the first line of defense against natural hazards that we have, which is the defense that's offered by the agencies and then the communities. So if you're going to be an agent for change, it's really simple. Change an agency. Develop a relationship, learn from them, and get them to adopt and to implement what are major advances in the research field. Innovation through integration. A lot of people, particularly from the New York Times, said, what did you do that's different? We had all these technologies in place. We had to show them. What we did is like the cell phone. There's nothing new in the cell phone, right? There's GPS, there's email, there's photography, there's a variety of different functions. Each one of these has been invented before or by whoever's ever running the iPhone or running the, the various phone that you may have has bought out. Um, but these were things that existed. It's the combination of them which is unique. And what we did in New York was a unique combination of different particular measures that they didn't in, in singularity deal with as great as they should have, but in combination certainly didn't deal with. So there's a lot to be, to be done in innovation through innovations. We need to build back better. There, there are a number of insurance clauses, and I've seen this in Christchurch, New Zealand, where they can only build back what they were replacing. And it's clear after these studies and after the risk has been refined by this work of people like yourselves that you can't build it back to where it used to be. A great example of this, they've built back a lot of the water supply, which is in asbestos cement pipelines. It even sounds bad, right? You don't even want to drink from it. And, and the problem is that these are very, very susceptible to small deformations, and they've been repaired very rapidly. Some of those have been replaced, but that was only the first tranche of money. The second tranche was tied to this replace in kind only. We need to build back better, and we need to advocate for it, and we need to create an environment in which that happens. And then finally, infrastructure gets improved, really, I think, by the fusion of innovative financing, by emerging technology and, and, and community engagement, that, uh, that we really need to take models that allow us to increase the liquidity. What we're doing with infrastructure now is we're building back infrastructure with taxes, with certain kinds of bond issues and uh, with tolls. But there's a community out there, I can guarantee it, that really wants to be involved. Typically the tiebreaker is a new technology because they're able to make money on the new technical uh, improvements and still be able to satisfy the different um, community organizations or the operators uh, with respect to what they're trying to build back. And finally, as a postscript, I'd like to indicate that I had the privilege of being um, an editor of a, the summer 2019 issue of The Bridge. That particular issue is, is focused on engineering for disaster resilience. Um, it's about resilient infrastructure. And uh, the website, it's completely free. You can actually go to the website, uh, get a copy of this. It's great reading. There are a number of people in this audience that actually are, are co-authors. And so I highly advocate doing this. I also thank you very much for participating in this wonderful meeting because it's been extremely enjoyable and what you do is extremely important.